him was kind of replacing him and introduced and just mimicked Bob really well. Uh, but unfortunately, I don't have the capability. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, so it is a great uh, fortune to have uh, Professor Ji Young Park from Chicago today uh, to deliver the CIQM seminar. Um, so I, I, I know Ji Young very long time that uh, I, I met him first time that when I started my postdoc work at the Berkeley where Ji Young was a graduate student in Paul McKinney's group and that's uh, as a first year, second year graduate student, that's the first time I met him in person. Um, Jim did uh, his uh, bachelor degree in Seoul National University in 1996 <laughs> and uh, moved to the Berkeley for his PhD, but uh, he's one of these unfortunate guys that um, his advisor moves during his PhD. So he dragged along to the Cornell, but he kept his uh, PhD seated in the Berkeley and got the PhD in 2003. After that, uh, he more or less, it's uh, one of the guys skipped the postdoc. Um, so he, uh, he, he was a junior fellow in the Roland Institute, it's kind of glorified postdoc, or I would say that it's a postdoc, higher postdoc type of position. So he had his own independent group uh, in the Roland Institute for a few years, like three or four years, and then, um, and then he moved to Cornell as a study his assistant professor, and he just moved to Chicago in two months ago, three months ago, so as a new home in the Chicago. So Jim did a lot of uh, uh, exciting and interesting work. The initial work uh, during the PhD and already part of the uh, Roller Institute is related to this molecular electronics. He's one of the first ones to demonstrate that how the electrons can uh, turn up through, uh, electrons can go through the single molecular device. Um, so wiring up the molecules in between the very small gap. And then uh, he moves on to the uh, growing the nanotubes and characterizing the nanotubes, a lot of interest in uh, the optical and electronic property of the nanotubes. Um, a few years ago, I think probably five or six years uh, ago, then um, actually a little bit more than that. And then he just kind of moved on to the growth of the graphene and 2D material. And he his group has been done a lot of beautiful work to grow and control the graphene growth, uh, the control the graphene growth up to the really exquisite levels. And that uh, capability is now expanding into the, all these uh, two-dimensional materials. And I'm, I heard some part of the talk already, but it's, uh, you will enjoy the really amazing stories today. There we go. Thank you. I am looking for a laser pointer. We don't have the laser pointer, but we have a stick. Oh, really? Okay, uh, this is new. <laughs> okay. Oh, thank you. That's better. Okay. Uh, I, I heard that this is recorded. So, uh, Bob, thanks for inviting me. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. Uh, I, I have fabu I, you know, had fabulous day uh, visiting you know different groups and learning about wonderful things and uh, thinking about all the new things that you know uh, I can do with people here and uh, you know I found that there, there is you know, extremely vibrant community uh, in related research field of course I expected that from you know Philip but you know outside of that you know I can see uh, amazing things that are happening so hopefully my visit here uh, will catalyze things that we can do together going forward so I, I really appreciate you making time to meet with me uh, as uh, you know Philip uh, just mentioned uh, by uh, I just moved to University of Chicago and so you know this is one of the first visits outside of Chicago to uh, give a seminar so I might make a reference to my move and then I might make a mistake of you know calling myself Cornelia but <laughs> we'll see <laughs> uh, so you know uh, let, let, let me you know start by you know point you know the reading the title of my presentation uh, so I say coloring, stitching, twisting for atomic cleft in circuitry. Okay, uh, it's intentional that I named uh, my seminar in this way. So atomic cleft in circuitry, everyone can understand, right? It's a circuit that is atomically thin. Uh, but I, I want to you know, pay attention to the, hope, you know, I hope, uh, coloring, stitching, and twisting. Uh, when we think about circuits that's in your pocket, for instance, or you know, in your laptop computer, we don't think about these verbs, 
coloring, hitting, and twisting. Uh, the, the reason why I started using these verbs is because these are the capabilities that we might need going to the future if you ever want to think about you know, generating automatically thin circuits with automatically thin material. So what do I mean by that? Uh, you know, wh what do we know about flat two-dimensional material? Paper comes close, right? Um, and so you know, we can think about color papers, for instance. The you know, clothes that we are wearing, that's another good example. So it's two-dimensional flexible. And once you want to make, you know, if you want to make something nice, then you need to stitch them together, et cetera. So uh, when we deal with two-dimensional materials, the capabilities that we need is something that is a little bit different from three-dimensional capabilities. So that is our starting point in our discussion. So hopefully I can deliver the, you know, uh, the message uh, you know, during my presentation. So these are some of the images fr uh, taken from our work. Uh, it'll become you know, pretty clear. This is a you know, artist rendering of uh, you know, molecular engineering uh, at University of Chicago. This is uh, uh, the first engineering school that's uh, ever been introduced to University of Chicago campus in its uh, glorious uh, history, I hear. Uh, it built and then fully occupied and uh, you know, one person in this audience, uh, Alex Hai, will uh, start as an assistant professor next year, so I look forward to having him there as well. Um, this is a photo of University of Chicago campus. I know a lot of people spend a lot of time at Chicago O'Hare Airport, like it or not. Uh, they do not come to Chicago campus a lot, so I just let me just tell you where things are. So this is the downtown uh, Chicago. It's beautiful, you know, downtown. It has second tallest building in the nation, and I think fourth as well. Uh, there is Lake Michigan just next to it. Chicago O'Hare is somewhere there, about 30 minutes away to the north. And this is University of Chicago campus, uh, founded 1890. Uh, very residential, very picturesque, just like this campus. It's only about 10 minutes drive, and President Obama's uh, house is somewhere here. <laughs> so th there are a lot to like about this campus. Uh, you, know, you can walk to the lake shore and you can take bike and then there is a bikeway from the campus all the way to downtown by the lake and you know, when the day is beautiful, a lot of people do that. So, uh, and at the same time, there are a lot of science going on. So this is where molecular engineering and you know, chemistry and then physics are all located and there are a lot of uh, excitement uh, because of the expansion that uh, is happening in this campus. J just brief introduction. I, I know that in this audience probably this is redundant, but just to put everyone on the same pace. Uh, the material that my group is studying is 2D atomic membrane or 2D layers material. And of course, graphene is mother of all this. And there is Walt leading expert in this audience, Philip. Uh, and so we, we know a lot about this graphene atomically thin material, just to rehash what we know. It's one or a few atoms thick, mechanical robust, impenetrable, and then it can be transparent to electron beam and optical you know, you know, signal as well. So there are a lot to like about this material. And now after years of work, this community now uh, realized that it, it's just you know, one of many two-dimensional materials that you can study. And for instance, you know, graphene is metal or semi-metal. Hexagonal boron nitride, which is a sibling of graphene, it's an insulator with pretty big band gap. Molybdenum disulfide, which I talk about a lot, uh, is a semiconductor, and then similar materials can be made with different electron and optical properties. And even very similar, uh, very uh, conventional materials such as glass can be made into atomically thin platforms such as 2D silicon oxide, my colleague at Cornell used to study a lot. So w w the, the great news is that we have a lot of choices in terms of two-dimensional materials with different electrical and optical properties. Another important question then is how are we going to grow? How are we going to control and then take advantage of these exciting materials? And so that, that is a fundamental question my group has been asking since about 2009. So it's been about six, seven years. So. Uh, but instead of just going through the laundry list of things that uh, we want to do, let me just use 
this familiar example as a platform for explaining our research goal. And uh, I tend to use this color paper uh, as an example uh, to explain our goal. So first, uh, we want to generate all these large scale color paper. Uh, so what do I mean by paper and what do I mean by color? I explained that paper is a similar material to atomic membrane because it's two dimensional, flexible, et cetera. Uh, to do anything nice about with two dimensional material, we, we first need to have color paper. And it can be semiconductor insulator or metal, or it could have optically different you know, color. Uh, but the key point is that we need to be able to generate these homogeneous film. And here, it has to be homogeneous without cracks, without wrinkles, without you know, no one scribbling on it. So there should be no dirt, for instance. So that is the first capability. And the second one is that once you do this, then you want to pattern them within individual things. So how can you put them together, put insulator and then semiconductor and metal together, together to form a circuit? I'm not talking about just random pattern, but controlled pattern so that we can form wire next to plate of insulator, for instance, and or electrode that's connecting to semiconductor. Once you do this, then in, you know, together you can form a full circuit based on these two capabilities alone. You can totally imagine. And now, once you do this, then there are third dimension that you can address, which is going in this route. So you can imagine putting them on top of each other to generate either multi-layer structures or heterostructures or super lattices to generate new material or build three-dimensional circuits based on individual layers of circuit. So these three capabilities alone will give you tremendous amount of capabilities going forward. So in the past few years, we, my group has been doing a lot of work addressing these three capabilities, and uh, my goal is to explain what we have done one by one. So let's look into the first question. How do we generate this color paper? The representative material that we are going to use is this transition metal dichargos. Of course, there is graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, but there are only two, uh, or I should say black and white material. But we are thinking about all color in between. Uh, so this is the general structure of transition metal dichargosonides. In the middle, you have transition metal atoms. Outside, we have charcosan. And we can use molybdenum, tungsten, and all the other things for transition metal. Outside, you can have charcosan of sulfur, selenium, and tellurium, for instance. When you do that, what you quickly see is the band gap changes from about 2 to 1.6 to about 1. And if you change metal on top of that, you can change the band gap even more dramatically. Even if you go to, if you go to niobium and tantalium, you can make semi-metal and the superconductor, et cetera. So within this same structural platform, you can make a whole lot of different kinds of material. Good. So that's exciting, but the question is, how are we going to make atomical, uh, the wafer scale films of these that is homogeneous and high quality? And on top of that, we don't want to spend a couple of years for each material. We want to generate very general technique that can grow a lot of these using a single platform. And for that, we have developed this new technique. Well, it's old technique that is growing this new material that's called MOCVD, and that is metal organic CVD technique. And it's, uh, in concept, it's very, very straightforward. You start with gas phase molecules, like in this case, molybdenum hexacarbonyl that has molybdenum atom in the middle. You have diacetyl sulfur that has single sulfur atom in the middle. And then you just introduce these in exactly the quantity that you want. And then if you do everything well, then you will grow monolayer of film for the, on the entire surface of wafer, such as silicon oxide on silicon. And this is a photo of our growth setup that was built two years ago. Now, th this is uh, conceptually very simple, okay? So you try it hard and then you will get it done. And uh, you know, my students tried about 500 growth. Uh, and after that, uh, you know, the goal is you know, straightforward. We make homogeneous, high quality monolayer films of this. And this is a result that they have generated. So this is a photo of four inch wafer, few silica substrate, and it's, you know, half of it is coated with monolayer of molybdenum disulfide. And the nice thing about MOCVD 
is that you can just change the molecular composition of your molecular precursor to grow different kinds of material. So instead of molybdenum hexacarbonate, you use tungsten hexacarbonate, then you will be able to grow tungsten disulfide with slightly different color. And all the optical properties confirm that this is exactly what happened. And all the properties that we have seen confirms in this, such as optical photo or photoluminescence shows that it's completely homogeneous film uh, that's laterally connected. Okay, so how did it work? So these materials, uh, just like a lot of material growth, uh, it works like nucleation and growth. So it first grows all these islands of crystals on the surface. And by the way, this is dark field image and dark field helium image and color represents different orientations. Okay. Uh, and if you look at it, then you see all these nucleated crystals that are growing. And I stopped the, gro uh, the growth in the middle and then took this image and here. And this one was taken here about a few inches away. What I hope you see is that the nucleation mechanism is very similar. Nuclear, uh, nucleation kinetics is very similar. So the crystal density is same. The crystal growth rate is about the same. So this homogeneous control over the large length scale is the key to controlling all this growth over a large length scale. Um, once you do this, then you can control a lot of different aspects. For instance, you can change the crystal size. So this is about 200 nanometer, few micron, and the all the way of fraction of a millimeter. That's the crystal size that you can control by just controlling the reaction conditions. And by the way, you, know, you cannot call these papers, right? Uh, paper needs to be continuous. So the important step is that you continue to grow until they merge together and then form tight bonding laterally. And in fact, this is a pretty difficult step that we realized. Under some condition, that will happen. Under some condition, that won't. So if you find the right condition, this is what you are going to get. So all these nice faceted crystals will merge and then will, bond, will be bonded laterally. And so that's where I will say fitting. And it is, so bond, it is bonded so well that it is mechanically completely continuous and strong. For instance, if this whole film can be peeled off and transferred to, onto TM grid, and you see the TM image of transferred film on TM, uh, TM grid. And all these things are membranes of monolayer of uh, molybdenum disulfide, except this one. This one popped, right? So this is a nice defect that we, uh, I, I can see. So, these are monolayer films that you can make. OK, how does it look uh, yeah, at the atomic scale? So this is atomic resolution STM image that shows that it is pretty good crystal with very few defects. And I actually do not see any. Uh, how about at the junction between different grains? And this is what you see. So there is one grain. There is another grain. They are really nicely stitched along these boundaries with minimum amount of defects along these directions. And I can assure you, if you don't, do not grow them well, then this grain boundary will not be pretty. So either it'll have a lot of junk, or it will have a lot of overlap, or it will have a lot of holes. So that's something that you'll see. Only the ones that, uh, uh, that's grown with high quality uh, will show this kind of very nice ideal grain boundary. So once we do this, then we can do a whole lot of electrical measurements. And you know, the material that we are growing is vapor scale, four inch vapor scale. And on top of that, we can make a lot of devices. Yes, Christian? Yes. And uh, so, you know, the question is whether these grain boundaries can be engineered. Uh, the rough orientation, yes. But whether it'll be really, really straight, that is something that we need to you know, think about. But you know, for instance, all these crystallites can be grown with a certain global orientation. I will show you some examples later on. Uh, so how about the electrical project? We can make a whole lot of devices at a single time. I'll show you some of the other data. So now our transistor devices that we can make with this film has about 99% of yield. If you push it harder, then it'll increase. One of ratio 10 to 7, uh, median room temperature mobility is about 30, which is not, it doesn't sound very high, but it is actually the value that you will see from exfoliated crystals at room temperature. So that's a you know, very close to benchmark number. 
uh, on top of that, what's important is the following. If you measure the mobility while you are changing the device scale and fabricated at different locations of the wafer, you see very, very similar uniform properties at room temperature. And we measure the mobility as a function of temperature, which shows this temperature dependence, su suggesting that the, the limiting factor in this mobility is not about the defect. It is the intrinsic coupling between electron and phonon. And so what does it say? Uh, what it says is that it might be the case that the grain boundary and the defect that is inevitable there will not be a you know, uh, severely limiting factor. And further experiment actually confirms that. So you know, using uh, our growth uh, process, we can change the grain size from one micron to three micron. When we did that, all the properties are exactly the same. You know, uh, you know, probably you can tell the difference between this set of data and this set of data. The only difference is the grain size, and you cannot see the difference. So what that suggests is that uh, these behaves almost like sink crystalline film to a certain degree. Uh, as I mentioned, we can make a lot of devices uh, using single fabrication run. This is four inch wafer. On this one, we have about 10,000 transistor devices with 99% yield. This can be made on transparent substrates as well. Uh, not only silicon oxide works for this, uh, we can grow all these films on hafnia, alumina, silicon nitride, quartz, even STO substrates. So there are a lot of substrates these processes will work and uh, we are expanding our substrate choices going forward. Now, uh, you know, you know, in passing, I, I just also want to mention that now that we have all these different you know, materials of composition becoming available, can you do something that is more uh, exciting? So of course, you know, my goal is to generate a paper, but we want to also generate very exciting paper as well. So uh, one of my students recently did this work. Uh, can you grow tungsten sulfide and tungsten selenide side by side? And so what you do is you start with tungsten sulfide, tungsten selenide, sulfide, selenide. And you, you can just do this by just controlling the time, right? And the length scale is about 500 nanometers, so the periodicity is over the other of 100 nanometers or so. We have pushed that to about 15 nanometer. So every 15 nanometer, you have different structure, uh, different composition material. Uh, so that was quite exciting. Uh, but one thing that I have seen uh, is uh, this. Uh, so tungsten sulfide and selenide, if you look at it, sulfur is smaller than selenide. So this is smaller in terms of the lattice constant. So if you look at the diffraction uh, spot, uh, diffraction, TM diffraction, then you look at this, this, this three spots, then you will see these two sets of different depression points because of the lattice mismatch, uh, lattice difference of 4%. Good, so that's what you expect when you grow tungsten sulfide and selenide together. Now, if you look at our sample, this is the TM diffraction limit for these three uh, same set of spots. And instead of having these two sets, you get this, right? So you have these two separate spots here, but it has single and then single. You take it here, then it looks different. You take it here, it looks different, right? So what's happening? And this is how we explain. Clearly something is happening to this uh, heterostructure crystal that we are growing. Uh, this is what, how you can explain. So this is tungsten sulfide lattice structure, and the tungsten selenide is supposed to be bigger. And these two crystals can meet with each other by creating a whole lot of defect along the interface, usually. But if you grow everything well, then this could happen, right? So one way to match these crystals is you compress it laterally and match this lattice and then this, and then create this homogeneous coherent crystal. And what that means is that there will be a whole lot of compression in the lateral direction when you grow them, right? And in fact, if you assume this kind of structure, then you can explain all the TM depression spots that you are seeing that was highly unusual. And another consequence of that is that sometimes this lateral very strong compression of 4%, it's actually pretty strong, can be relaxed in the vertical direction. So this is an AFM image of our crystal. And if you look at this flat area, please ignore all this bilayer, okay? So that's not what I want you to see. I want you to see all these wrinkles. Uh, so this is tungsten sulfide, but all these compressed, compressed tungsten selenide gets buckled up and down, okay? And if you look at the periodicity of these buckles, then it precisely matches what you expect, right? 
So 4% of compression and then surface energy, all that will give you these compressions. So, and you know, on top of that, of course, we have a lot of PM data and a lot of things that shows that this crystal, super lattice, is defect free almost uh, crystal with all these junctions. And so we are very excited about generating all these new materials by controlling uh, these compositions going forward. Okay, so that was the first topic. How do we grow paper, right? With different composition and how do we put them together? Um, the second topic is to connect them laterally to form circuits and then to basically do paper art within our uh, paper. Uh, good, uh, so this is something that we, have, we did a long time ago. Uh, we, you know, about now four years ago. So at the time the dream was this, right? So we want to combine some insulating film with conducting film all laterally within atomically thin film. If you can do this with one atom thick film, then it is likely that we should be able to do it with thicker film. So that is our approach. So uh, when we started, so these are the you know, structures that we can make, for instance, metal to insulator, or even within the same metal, we can probably control the doping concentration, so you can make in-plane uh, PN junctions, for instance. Uh, these have been generated in our lab in what technique? By the way, when you do this, we want to pattern them, right? We don't want to rely on randomness of the growth. So the technique that we developed is called patterned regrowth technique. Uh, so we grow with, we grow the first film, in this case, graphene on copper, and they use photolithography and burn away all the graphene on you know, these substrates. And then the second film can grow only on this freshly exposed surface area. So once you do that, then one layer and then another layer located side by side. If you do everything well, these two films will connect laterally together. So that's you know, a lot of work. But after all the optimization of the process, this is something that you can see if you grow graphene and graphene. You are not supposed to see anything because it's stitched nicely, and that's exactly what you see when you do this boring combination. What if you do this boring, uh, more exciting combination such as graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, right? Then what you get is metal to insulating transition. And this is a TM image of the film when, I, when you did that. So in the middle, what you have is graphene you have a certain polycrystalline structure that you can see. Outside, you have hexagonal boron nitride uh, that is interfacing very nicely right here. Good. So what it shows that is that we can grow them side by side. We can connect them side by side. Uh, having said that, doing this uh, with TM each time will be painful. So one thing that we worked on uh, you know, is to develop optical technique to image this directly. And why is it tricky? Because if you look at graphene, uh, this is the absorption curve. Molybdenum sulfide is very easy. It's a semiconductor, and then it, everything happens in visible wavelength. Hexagonal boron nitrate is super tough because the absorption peak is at about 6.1 electron volt, right? It's DVB. Uh, seeing all these optical phenomena over this wide spectrum is very difficult. Why? Because there is something called chromatic aberration that distorts all the images. So, to do this, what we did was we combined you know, broadband light source with uh, lens-free optics. It's basically mirror-based. And so this is the schematic of our hyperspectral microscope. And it's lens-free microscope that relies on only mirror. And when you do that, chromatic aberration is gone. And so you can take picture at 6.1 electron volt, 4.7 electron volt for graphene, and then combine them side by side, and it looks like this. So you can take all these photos without chromatic aberration. And in fact, this image was taken in this area. So it matches really, really nicely. Why this is important? Because it confirms the chemical nature of every point. So that's why it's important. And so the, it becomes a very useful tool going forward, identifying exactly one material is grown where. I'm sorry? Here? Oh, this is TM, I'm sorry. So this is TM, so this whole thing was actually deposited on very thin silicon nitride membrane, and we took this optical image, and on this, you know, at this point, we took TM too. So we do this TM optical correlation microscopy a lot. Uh, of course, all these are optical scale or you know, few nanometer scale images. Uh, 
But if you really want to compound the nature of this lateral connex, uh, connection, you can rely on something like cross-sectional ELS imaging that uh, my uh, collaborator David Mueller does. Uh, what it is is that you go in and then take tiny sample and then take energy load spectroscopy that tells you exactly what elements are located where. So you see there is graphene, there is boron coming from hexagonal boron nitride connecting side by side. The whole thing is sitting on silicon oxide, so you see huge oxygen peak. So what it shows that is that it's connecting nicely from the side. So now what you know, the, the, the conclusion from this is we know how to connect these laterally, at least for this combination. Once you do this, you can limit the position of all the electrons, right? So you know, here you can go, here you cannot go because it's an insulator. So with this, basically you can form electrode and circuit. And another nice thing about this kind of uh, approach is that once the film has been generated or circuit has been generated, it can be peeled off, transferred, peeled off, transferred, and you can stack them vertically. So this is the schematic. This is our, uh, this is an optical image of our device. So you, all the black lines, gray lines are graphene, and everything is connected to, uh, connected with boron nitride. So if you zoom in, you see this. Good, did it work? Um, yes, again, this is schematic. Uh, one thing that you can imagine is that, you know, in the vertical direction, the number of atoms is constant everywhere. So it should be flat. And that's exactly what you see. And so if you compare this area and this area, basically the histogram is you know, perfectly the same. But conductivity is patterned. If you use EFM, then you can see the strong conducting region within graphene. And actually one thing that's interesting is that there is a slight contrast between this and this because this area is coated with one monolayer of hexagonal boron nitride. Okay. And in fact, you can measure the conductivity this way, this way, and this way. They all behave similarly. And during all this process, what amazed us is that the electrical conductivity really didn't degrade. So um, graphene and hexagonal boron nitride, they are pretty tough. That's something that we have seen. Uh, more recently, we uh, started up you know, using this technique for generating different kinds of junctions, not only graphene hexagonal boron nitride, but graphene to semiconductor of molybdenum sulfide and tungsten sulfide. The reason being that uh, we, we still, uh, as a community, are looking for very, very good contact electrode material for all these two-dimensional uh, films. So this is a photo of what we generated. So this, again, was done in vapor scale. So graphene was grown, transferred to silicon oxide surface, patterned, and now we exposed silicon oxide surface on which we grow molybdenum disulfide. And so this is what we made. Phot photoluminescence image confirmed most two. All these Raman signal shows graphene. You put them side by side, you can see a circuit or patterned array. Uh, now, how does it behave electrically? So just briefly, what we do is that we measure two terminal device conductance while we are changing the length scale of this conducting channel for most two of semiconductor. And if you do this, then you can extract the contact resistance between most two and graphene, not for the electrode, uh, for the metal electrode. When you do this, we saw something that is quite interesting. So this, uh, this is the data that shows uh, the conclusion. Uh, here, we measure the resistance as a function of length uh, of the channel, and this y-axis cross-section will tell you the expected uh, contact resistance from this side-by-side -side contact between graphene and TMD. And we are seeing about 20 kilo ohm. Is it high, is it low? Well, you know, if you compare that to the value that you will see from this conventional bulk electrodes that you deposit from the top, uh, then we are seeing that it is, you know, factor few better or almost order of magnitude better. Uh, there could be better method going forward to make you know, even better contact, but it is still very surprising that atomically thin film and another atomically thin film connected by one dimensional contact gives you such good contact resistance. So this will be an important capability going forward for forming circuit. Okay, so two down, one more. <laughs> So now we are, uh, we are stacking things. Uh, having said that, you know, so far I haven't, you know, I haven't sh shown you a, a single bit, uh, bit of science. I, you know, I hope you, you know, recognize that, right? So everything that I talked about is really kind of a, you know, hard labor. You know. 
grow film, making paper, and then patterning, all that. Uh, so now when you stack these things on top of each other, and this is where the analysis breaks down. So our material is paper, but it is made out of really well-defined atoms. Right? Of course, paper is made out of atoms, but they are fiber. But instead, what we have is a crystal. And that is sitting on top of each other when you stack on top of each other. So when you do this, there are interesting things happen, right? That otherwise you cannot do. One great example is this twisted bilayer graphene business. So for instance, if you take bilayer graphene out of your pencil lead, uh, then they are all aligned pretty much because that's what nature prefers. But if you stack one layer on top of the other, then you can do whatever you want. You can generate this. How do we understand in terms of band structure? This is how you can understand. There is one direct cone that belongs to one layer. There is another direct cone that belongs to the other layer. And the distance between the two is controlled by this global rotation between the two. <laughs> right? So that much we can see. Uh, one thing that is interesting about this band structure is that they will overlap here and then here. Okay, avoid this crossing, then of singularity, and then optical you know, transition between these two. So what you expect is that there will be strong interlayer absorption whose energy will strongly depend on what? Interlayer rotation angle. So that's what you predict. Good? So did it work? We've done a lot of correlated TM and optical measurement. So for instance, this is the optical absorption spectra of Bona stacked bilayer graphene, the natural bilayer graphene. So this is the TM diffraction image. So you see only single set of spots because it's aligned. And this is pretty much twice of single layer graphene absorption. It's almost exactly the same. Now, what happens if you rotate it? So nine degrees rotated, you see two sets of rotate, uh, spots. Then now you see something interesting, right? So this is the interlayer absorption peak that I predicted. And what you can expect is if you increase the rotation angle, this energy of interlayer absorption peak should increase. Okay. Of course, the maximum degree of rotation is 30 degrees. And by the time you reach 30 degrees, um, it is completely different compared to the original one. So uh, what happened? Uh, when you rotate this interlayer rotation angle, change this, then you change the color of the material, right? And you don't expect that from just normal paper, but since these are atoms that are interacting, you will see this kind of behavior. You can subtract this bottom line and then see the evolution of these nice interlayer absorption peak. If you do this for about you know, several dozen samples, then you can generate this 3D color plot where this interlayer absorption peak can be seen as a function of this uh, rotation angle. And it turns out that there is not only one, but there are two interlayer absorption peaks. And that's predicted as well. And using this now, uh, what we can do is that whenever you have this twisted bilayer graphene, you don't need to do TM anymore. You just go in and then do optical spectra you just find out where the peak is located, and then you use this to find out or read out the interlayer rotation angle and then generate a 2 dimensional map. So this is something that you can do right away. Good. Uh, having said that, you know, this is uh, interesting, but if you want to do anything useful out of this, this is not good enough. You, know, you need a film that has uniform rotation angle everywhere then you can you know, do something useful, hopefully, uh, with that. But the problem is that the film that we grow generally have this problem of polycrystallinity and random orientation of all the crystallite. So if you take half of it, stack the half, you know, stack one half on, on top of the other, then you will see this random bilayer polycrystal sample. That's what you can see. The way out for this problem is that you start with something like this. You want to start with a film that, is, that has global lattice orientation everywhere. When you do this, you stack one on top of the other, then you will be able to create bilayer graphene that has uniform rotation angles everywhere. Right? So that is the you know, idea, but the question is how can you do that? Um, so this is something that we worked on past few years. Uh, we decided to use the surface as our GPS. So you know, for instance, if you take copper 100, and if you think about this symmetry of you know, one orientation or the other orientation of graphene, it just doesn't work, right? But if you use copper 111, it kind of works, right? So hexagonal symmetry and hexagonal symmetry. 
So perhaps copper one-on-one -on -one will work well to orient the growth of graphene along a certain direction. The problem is that you, you go and uh, you know, look at the manufacture of copper one-on-one -on -one single crystalline you know, substrate. It's pretty expensive. And each time you grow graphene on it, you need to dissolve copper away to look at your film. So if you want about 100 flows to complete on study, it's a whole lot of copper, expensive copper that you need to dissolve away. It's like the price of gold. Uh, so it's, it's, not, it's not a working proposition. Uh, so instead, you know, uh, what my student worked on is, OK, so let's generate copper 111 foil everywhere, right? Uh, so we, found, we, we, we tried different copper foil, and then we found a winning combination. So this particular foil uh, has been recrystallized by heating it up gently, and then, well, actually, pretty high temperature, and then annealed for a long time. Uh, so this is X-ray diffraction of single crystal copper one-on-one. -on -one. OK, so it looks like single crystal. Our foil looks like this to begin with, amorphous. After our thermal recrystallization, this is what it looks like. Okay, it's copper one on one everywhere, but it is not just the copper one on one surface that is important, but the orientation of copper one on or the orientation of these three spots everywhere is uniform across the six in, across the whole substrate. Okay, so using that now, what we have is the surface has orientation everywhere on copper, and if you do growth well on this substrate, then you get something like this. Instead of polycrystalline film, you get this homogeneous orientation film everywhere. You get a little bit of defect, about 2 3%. Uh, but it works. And so we can control the orientation of graphene. And also, this is for hexanoboron nitride. Hexanoboron nitride orientation is fixed as well. So now what do we have? We have this well-aligned graphene films in one direction. I'm going to skip the next few slides. It has some beautiful science done recently published uh, results, but uh, it's going to take a while. OK. So now we have this film with uniform orientation. What do we do? We, you know, it's pretty simple after that. We have a uniform orientation film. You cut it in half, right? And then you stack it this way, this way, this way, this way. Then you can control the interlayer orientation angle globally. Without, you know, we don't need to know exactly what orientation each film is. We just need to control this orientation. And to do this, uh, I mean, to demonstrate that carefully, here is the result. We have all these lines, and th these lines are all published, uh, pub fabricated simultaneously, parallelly. And one film is deposited, and the another film is deposited with you know, some tilt angle. And by just reading out this angle, you know exactly what the rotation angle is. So in this case, it's 85, but it is actually 25 degrees because 60 degrees is zero in graphene, right? Uh, so this is zoom in of one array. If you look at only one, then this is what it looks like. So you know where twisted bilayer graphene of controlled orientation is located within this film. Now, did it work? Uh, I remind you, we know uh, we have a way to directly read out this, you know, controlled rotation angle. So 90 degree, we mapped it. We saw what we expected. We control it. So what you are seeing is that by just controlling this rotation angle, we can change the color of this material. And by the way, this is only for two, you know, two layer. <coughs> As you go to uh, higher number of layers, these uh, things can be used to generate new kinds of optical properties as well. By layer absorption. Yeah. It's about uh, one monolayer absorption ex you know, extra. Yeah, yeah, that's the typical uh, scale of absorption, about you know, a couple percent more. Okay, good. Uh, but again, this part is a you know, uh, it's an interesting demonstration, but fundamentally no new science. Uh, but th this I think has some new science, and uh, you know, for a long time we we kind of wanted to this, and actually we wondered this question. So, you know, when you stack these two films with a controlled rotation angle, let's say 20 degrees, there are two ways. One is doing this way, or the other one is, is doing this way. Uh, you, know, you might consider them the same, but actually they are not the same. One of them is rotated clockwise, the other one is counterclockwise. 
these are stereoisomers, or you know, uh, you know, uh, and so one of them is left-handed, and the other one is right-handed. So that's exactly pictured here. And why didn't people study this before? Because there was no way of knowing it, if it's whether it's uh, rotated left-handed or right-handed. But we have a way to control it. So we did that. And once you do this, then you can do circular dichroism measurement. So CD spectra characterization. And this is the result. As a function of photon energy, what you measure is, roughly speaking, the difference between the absorption of right-handed photon and left-handed photon. Right? And what you see is a huge peak here and a huge dip here. When you move from left-handed film to right-handed film, it changes the polarity. And the magnitude of this signal is actually pretty significant. Uh, of course, this is atomically thin film. So to be fair, it needs to be normalized to a thickness. When you do that, this magnitude is comparable to the CD spectra that you see from plasmonic uh, helical structures that people generate, for instance. Uh, so uh, we were very surprised by this magnitude. And this is tunable because the peak location matches the interlayer absorption peak location. By just controlling this angle, you can see this beautiful evolution of the CD peak position that exactly matches the interlayer location. Uh, so how do we understand why, why, you know, why does it come from, right? And just, just roughly speaking, this is how we understand. Whenever you have light uh, coming down to graphene, it excites dipole oscillation in parallel to electric field. That gives you linear absorption, right? But when you have this twist in our sample, instead of just only this linear you know, dipole moment oscillation, you can think about these as uh, this helical dipole motion. And depending on the chirality of the structure, it could do this or it could do this. And the magnetic moment that's coming from this solenoidal motion is opposite depending on the structure or chiral structure of the film. And not only we, we did this, develop this argument, we did you know, first principles calculation on this, it quantitatively matches what you are seeing. So we are pretty excited about this capability and we want to find out whether this is general property going forward or not. Meaning that can this be seen on other two-dimensional material? But symmetry is, is it the internal symmetry is that should happen. That should happen. Yeah, I agree. Is seen or not is the question, right? That's the question. Yeah. Yes. And another thing that I want to mention is that this is absorption based. Yeah. But can it happen without absorption? And so that's another thing. So you know, can you change the uh, can you see by reference from this as well? So Yes, yes, but how big is always the question. So I, I absolutely agree with you. Uh, good, so you know, at least I, I've shown you a couple of examples of new things that you can see when you stack one film on top of another and when you treat these films with atoms, right? Uh, now, going forward, what's also very essential is to do this. Uh, we want to stack all these new films vertically one by one, but when you do this, you want to do this with a, a bit of condition. Of course, this has been done in small scale. I mean, Philip and then also Honkun, they are doing beautiful work with stacked structures uh, that's generated with exfoliated samples. But we want to do it in wafer scale, with the billions that we are growing in wafer scale. And by the way, when you stack these on top of each other, it turns out that the bane of the problem is that you get a lot of contamination and air trapped in between. That's hard to control. So we want to make it contamination and air free. Uh, so this is something that we uh, completed recently and we are about to submit this work. Uh, so we've developed new process which we call vacuum stack and peel process. Vacuum stack and peel. So how does it work? We first peel up one layer with some sticky tape and that works. Uh, we can just peel it off. And this is a photo of one more layer of most two that has been peeled from the growth of surface, two inch wafer scale, and the bottom surface will be very clean because it has been just peeled. And you take this to sample of the next layer, right? So the stacking interface between this one and this one will be very clean because we didn't use any polymer or tape. Uh, and then peel it off, and it works too, as you can see here. And then you just repeat, as you can see. And you can repeat it as many as possible, as many layers as you like. One thing that we didn't like is that 
still at the interface there is water or uh, air. So now this crucial step of generating interface between one layer and another is done in vacuum. Okay. So as a result, the whole stacking step is done in vacuum as well. When you do this, uh, it, it works pretty well. So for instance, this is a TM image, cross-sectional TM image of three layer, all grown at on different surfaces and then stacked. Molybdenum selenide, molybdenum sulfide, and tungsten sulfide. These are somehow accidentally aligned to the beam direction. So you see rows of atoms very well. Uh, if you actually count the number of atoms in this direction, then you see that molybdenum selenide has two less, two fewer, because the lattice constant is bigger by 4%. Um, this tungsten sulfide is rotated a little bit, so that's why it looks like a line. And you can do all these electron energy low spectroscopy to confirm the identi chemical identity of individual layer. So that was a few months ago. Now, the image that we are uh, putting into our paper is something like this. So this one has nine layer. Uh, molybdenum, tungsten, molybdenum, tungsten, molybdenum, tungsten, molybdenum, tungsten, molybdenum. Grown on nine different substrates, stacked one on top of the other. And finally, the whole thing is sitting on silicon surface. So you can see them pretty well. Good, so you know, we are very excited about that. Yep. I'm sorry? Uh, I don't have a slide here. We did AFM measurements, for instance. It's much flatter, and then it, ha it doesn't have trapping. So if you do this in air, then you see all these bubble-like features that you see all the time. That's completely fine. And there are a lot of other evidences that I'm going to show you. Um, so with this now, again, this is generated in vapor scale. Almost none. <laughs> Believe it or not. Almost none. We gently heat it up to kind of relax the top polymer layer to make the audition, you know, promote it in vacuum, maybe 100 degrees. Uh, at the final step, uh, we, we only need to burn away all the carbon on the top surface. Only the top layer sees anything dirty. I don't remember, but it's not very hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, that's all. Uh, we, we actually use acetone and IPA to clean it off and then just you know, only need to and get rid of everything. So with this film, uh, now we can do all the process. So this is a thin film that's generated in vapor scale with arbitrary vertical composition. That's the punchline, yeah. It's one four. It's a, it, the, 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 <laughs> yeah, it, all, 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 the thing is that still, you know, you are getting rid of a lot of stuff. Uh, so, you know, when I asked my students to do this, they came up with like, you know, like $100,000 wish list to build UHV setup. Uh, instead, the final setup cost about $500. <laughs> I, I, I bet. But uh, the result is day and night still, right? So it's 99 point something percent reduction in terms of air in the two. Uh, so with this, we can make a whole lot of you know, devices. Uh, so for instance, you know, th this is, we, we decided to make tunnel you know, barrier devices, because it turns out that this is one of the most difficult uh, film that you can make. Because you know, for it to work as a tunnel device, it should be really intrinsic. And for it to behave ideally, what that means is that you need to control the doping level very well. It should not have pinhole. It should not have a lot of trappings in the middle, etc. So anything bad to the film will show up. Uh, so we generated this kind of stack geometry, so gold, N-layer film, and then gold. And then uh, we measure you know, IV current, basically. It's fairly straightforward. So am I going to see leakage current, or am I going to see tunnel barrier current? Uh, that's exactly what we are looking for. And then if it's tunnel current, it should behave exponentially to, uh, the sensitive to the layer number exponentially, too. So this is the result. Three layer, six layer, and nine layer. These were blown up by 1,000 times and 0.1 million times. You see nonlinear IV characteristics. That's exponentially dependent on the layer number. So this is more statistics. So three to 10 layer. And these are all made, you know, a bunch of them. And then if you put them, then it follows, you know, pretty nice exponential curve. And now 
the, you know, this dotted line uh, behind, it's a theoretical model with a single parameter of tunnel barrier height, right? So with this single number, you fit all the behaviors pretty nicely. What that means is that our film behaves rather, you know, ideally. And one thing that we can do is now after that, we can change the composition from most to, to tungsten sulfide, then this conduction band goes up and as a result, tunnel barrier height increased by about 0.4 electron volt. All this resistance increases by four orders of magnitude universally. So that is also constant as well. If you go to a higher number, well, about the similar number, you can also measure the capacitance. Then all this capacitance measurement was, uh, you know, it follows almost cl uh, close to one over n behavior and the dielectric constant is of the order of three. This is close to the monolayer dielectric constant. Uh, you can make heterojunction between, you know, that's generated with tungsten sulfide and MOS2. When you do this, you actually see this beautiful diode behavior. Uh, th there is something similar that's generated in, um, you know, electrical engineering community. It's called metal insulator, insulator, metal tunnel diode. And here, what they're controlling is all this band alignment. And so you break the symmetry of the structure as a result, you can create this tunnel diode behavior that we are seeing and it, it makes sense. So you know, what you can see is that we, we can make electronically very sound uh, films that is stacked layer by layer. Uh, we can make membranes as well because after all these things can be peeled and stacked uh, and still mechanically very strong. So this is seven layer most film that is transferred onto TM grid without any supporting film. Uh, you can see that it's continuous. And since it's very thin, it's transparent. So you can see stuff that's located underneath through this transparent seven layer film. And you can pattern them using, for instance, focused on, focused ion beam milling, and you can see the result as well. No, no, no. So we use the same technique. We just, you know, put it down and then get rid of this thermal real estate. We just heat it up. Um, yeah. And by the way, it, it, it's painful when that doesn't work because you know, creating the seven layer, you actually need to do this step seven times. Anyway. Um, okay. Uh, my time is almost up. Um, but w what I want to show you uh, in the next few minutes is the future, right? So everything that I talked about is a past. Of course, this past will you know, uh, give us new opportunities, but really new future. What, what, what do we want to do with this, right? After all, generating another transistor, another photodiode, or another solar cell is not the goal that we are aiming for, at least in the you know, long term. Um, so when you have these you know, paper, what do you do? Uh, one of the things that you do is this, right? Okay, you fold and then, you know, so you, you take paper and then you generate beautiful three-dimensional structures or you cut it to pieces so that, you know, opening a book will open a castle, right? Three-dimensional structures. So silicon has limitation in terms of this. But if it is really true atomically thin films, this can be done. W why atomically thin film? It turns out that, uh, you know, this scaling problem is a very important one. So this is a slide that, uh, that I stole from my advisor, uh, Paul McEwan's talk. And so let's imagine a piece of paper, right? When you fold things to three-dimensional shape, you know, and paper origami, you have blue lines that fold backward and then red lines that fold inward. And then you need to fold everything in a systematic way. When you do that, then you can generate arbitrary three-dimensional structure. That's actually what people in computer science community and math community are proving, like Eric Domain in, at MIT, right? So that's known. Uh, so do you know what this makes? It's a white elephant. Uh, and, you know, uh, now the question is, if you want to make micron-scale elephant, what do you do, right? Uh, what you do is obviously you need to scale it down, not meter, but probably a few tens of micron, okay? One thing that is fundamental about this problem is that not only the size of the paper, but the thickness of the paper should be scaled exactly by the same factor. And quickly you realize that you need atomically thin paper to do this. And another important thing is that 
the bending stiffness, the most important parameter for folding, is a factor of, you know, it scales with volume. What I mean by that is that if you increase the thickness of the film from one nanometer to 10 nanometer, then the stiffness increases by three orders of magnitude. So silicon film that is 10 nanometer thick has fundamentally too stiff for all the things that you want to do. So once you do this, then there are a lot of interesting things that you can at least imagine. For instance, let's do some scaling problem. One square centimeter film, one nanometer thick, you fold it to a box, then that's about 50 microns. And you know, slightly bigger than a cell, pixel. Uh, and one square centimeter is a really, really large surface area where you can put a whole lot of transistors and memory devices you, you can squeeze in. And we already have an example in our daily life, or not someone's daily life, like parachute, right? What do you do? You carry parachute packed, and then you open it when you need it. Uh, why do we want to do this? Well, maybe we can introduce all these circuits into our body, all tightly wound up, but expand or measure something and then expand to you know, telecommunicate the signal to outside or absorb light to retard their battery. I don't know, okay? Uh, this is all kind of a you know, sci-fi like, but you know, the, the you know, big thing is that we want to do things with circuits that circuits are not supposed to do, right? So these are the things that we are very much excited to explore and actually uh, we are amazed that uh, we are actually funded to explore these ideas by you know, DOD, of course. Uh, so we, we, you know, we, we are exploring many different ideas. You know, we can do cutouts, we can do folding, and then we can do 3D growth. I'm not going to bore you with our, our proposal, uh, but we are really breaking down the problem in, the sis in systematic way. For instance, how do we define those red lines and blue lines for folding, right? What are the mechanisms to operate this movement from this flat paper to folded structure? And once it's folded, how do we activate the binding between different surfaces? Because you need to do this systematically one by one. Uh, and so th there are a lot of creative challenges. Uh, you know, and then actually it's a combination of physics and uh, chemistry, which I like the most. Uh, but well, I, I should show you this. Oops. And you know, I think the, the important aspect is that our films really gives us a very good paper-like platform that no one else had before. So this is a wafer uh, with coated with one monolayer film. We are just dipping it into water and you can see that it delimates, delaminates really nicely. And you know, if you want to just peel it off, then you know, using the sticky tape, you can just peel off one layer you know, after another. So combination of these techniques will give a lot of uh, exciting capabilities going forward. So in the interest of time, I'll go to the you know, most important slide. This is my group. Uh, of course, none of the work that I showed was done by me. And then this is my group. Uh, and then this photo was taken when they were visiting Chicago for the first time uh, in preparation of the movie. And this is a restaurant called Promontory. I highly recommend it. <laughs> and of course, you know, I had the pleasure of working <coughs> with this you know, great collaborator. And I hope uh, some of you will collaborate with us too. Thank you very much. Questions? Uh, so my question going after Christian is about this uh, weight to scale stacking. I mean, that's quite a big breakthrough. You know, that, and so I guess the question, though, you know, as we're all aware, is like it's a big difference between stacking or even having bubbles versus having like an atomically, you know, intimately, perfectly touching interface. So do you have any sense right now over like what yield, you know, over that wafer that like really these these things are stacking? You know, you know, you think so. Yeah. So I showed you nine layers, right? So all the you know n goes to ten, right? And so we, we have done a lot of global measurements, not you know, one Gs and two Gs, to make that nine layer, um, you know, that with that quality, every step should work almost perfectly. Uh, so what we know is that after peeling off, we look at it under Raman microscope to see any remnants of small crystallites that's left behind, none. So if you just look at the Raman signal before and after, 
then you know that gives you a pretty clear idea. And we just you know the 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 thing is that you know, when we were developing this process, you know growth and then this peeling off and stacking process that alone between one and two layer we spent many months because maximizing that uh, yield to almost perfection is the foundation for everything else, right? So I guess, you know, th there's still this mystery as like what Krishan was mentioning that, you know, we, we know that there's hydrocarbon layers covering all these materials. And so the question is, and then for sure it's felt on tour. So, you know, when you put these interfaces together, you know, are we thinking then that this stuff is being pushed out on now the millimeter or centimeter scale? Or, you know, it, it, yeah, it's just, where does it go, you know? What you know is that, you know, I mean, I cannot speculate. Uh, I will just tell you some data. Uh, so at least, you know, according to our yields measurement, uh, carbon, you know, for that nine layer sample that I talked about is not there. Uh, so that's all I can say. Whether, you know, hydrocarbon was there to begin with, I don't know, because we didn't characterize. Uh, but after all these nine stacks and then generated and the yields measurement, we, we don't see it. Uh, one thing that I can say is that this stacking will not get rid of stuff that has been deposited during the growth. So the stacking, stacked film is as good as the grown film. So, you know, uh, to get very clean this uh, stacked film, you need to optimize the stacking, which we are working on, but also you need to start with excellent quality film as well. So the, the final product that I was showing is the result of a lot of work. <laughs> I, I can show you a lot of dirty data, too. Uh, uh, great talk. Um, when you use the thermal release tip to stick the single layer, uh, the 2D material, is that layer still sticky? And if so, can you use that to directly stick on another layer multiple times so you can just not release everything at once? I, I'm, I, I don't get the, the so question. When you take the tape and then you stick on one layer, is it still sticky? Uh, so the, the first film is thermal release type, yeah. and that first was used to peel off the first one because we need to start from somewhere, right? And so the bottom side is you know, now have one monolayer, and then we keep using this to peel off the second one and the third one. So you don't we don't. We just do this. And so it becomes a stamp, stamp that we keep doing this. And then at the final step, we heat it up and then release it. So the stickiness does not come from sticky tape. It comes from the interaction between most two to most two, between these two dimensional layers. Ever. So in principle, there is no limit. We have tested up to like 11. Uh, we can keep going, but I don't know. <laughs> I think it's enough. <laughs> yeah. So I, uh, for the uh, banking transfer, I heard the, uh, you mentioned about the acetone and IP. Uh, at the final step. Uh, final final step. So, do they uh, have any chance to contaminate uh, nine layer or other? Inside? Inside? No. No. Any, any no. So, that doesn't no. contaminate? As far as we can tell. Christian? You mentioned a copper template growth mode for graphene, uh, basically alignment of the nucleation uh, sample. Have you figured out something similar for the selenites and the sulfites? Um, with an appropriate lattice constant and symmetry, or is that still? Uh, so the orientation. Yes. For the, uh, the so orientation, orientation, yeah. yeah. Uh, actually, it's easier. It's uh, we we have been using you know different crystalline surfaces. Uh, it tends to align. Uh, so, but we haven't pushed it hard enough. So I, I think there is a registry. Uh, no, uh, the registry is too strong. Orientation control. Single crystal substrate to get preferred orientation. Please tell me if you don't. Huh? <laughs> no, I, I, I no. Yeah. Just substrate engineering. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, because space is isotropic, so it's a, as far as I can tell, no. Uh, so far none. So please tell me. If, uh, and yeah. And boron nitride was one. On copper one one one. Yep. Randomly oriented polycrystal? 
Uh, I mean, yes and no. Uh, I don't think we tried point sweeper. We, you know, we, we tried a few centimeter scale. Okay. Uh, you know, this is our favorite topic between Philip and I, and I hate world I try. He loves it. It's a tough nut to, to grow. Yeah, I'm surprised that you're uh, able to have it in large areas. Yeah, but that was monolayer, and then you, you, pick, you, you see that I took only you know, a few slides on pectoral bone nitro. I hate them much. Any other questions? Okay, here we go. For the right hand and left hand configuration, <coughs> say you have plus 20 degree twisting angle. So can I think of the other pair like 60 minus 20? Yeah, degree? it's the same. Yeah. So if that's the case, can I just go back and forth between these two configurations just by shifting without any rotation? No, just no, like the no, AB no, no, and PA is different. No, 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 no. It's a you know, it's a rotation is different. And are you a theorist? No. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I some you know yeah p, p, you know, uh, some theorists uh, when they model uh, all these uh, you know two dimensional uh, two layer uh, graphene film uh, ha, ha, sometimes make a mistake of putting all the atoms in the zero plane. And you know, it turns out that as long as the, you control the matrix element in the proper way, the result is the same. So they tend to do that and then they get confused. But there is Z dimension. And so putting that Z dimension actually gives you a, a chirality. So, no. Okay, so let's thank the speaker again. Any questions you can come back. Thank you.